By July 1969, the battle lines in the ruling Congress party were already drawn. On the one side stood Indira Gandhi, then Prime Minister under siege, now fighting a relentless struggle for political survival. Supporting her were the young Turks and radicals within the party. On the other side stood the old guard, represented in the cabinet by the Deputy Prime Minister and Finance Minister Morarji Desai. Although the battle was ostensibly for the control of the Congress party, both sides took their postures on high moral grounds. Mrs. Gandhi and her supporters continuously reminded the Congress of the party's unfulfilled commitment to socialism. And among the many radical provisions which were promised but which remained unimplemented was the nationalization of banks. Some of us who were in the Congress party, relatively younger people, thought that uh, the resources of the society are there concentrated in banking institutions. It was our firm belief that this resource that is concentrated in the banking institution is the property of the nation of the, all the people and the, it should be used for the benefit of all the sections of the society. The July 1969 session of the Congress Party held in Bangalore had seen the divide between the two factions in the Congress almost complete. Although the party did ratify the resolution for the nationalization of banks, it was opposed by the Finance Minister Morarji Desai. On the 16th of July 1969, Indira Gandhi took away the finance portfolio from Morarji Desai, who promptly resigned from her cabinet. By November 1969, the Congress Party had split. In February 1970, the Supreme Court struck down the nationalization of banks as unconstitutional. But Indira Gandhi renationalized them through another ordinance. The feeling was that under the private ownership and private management, the banks were not doing enough to help agriculture, small industry, retail traders, and other important but hitherto neglected sectors of the economy. That was the dominant motivation behind the idea to nationalize the major banks in the country. But to this day, many economists believe that nationalization of banks could have been avoided. The reason why I feel that bank nationalization not only could, but should have been avoided, uh, was that the, the uh, ownership by government uh, led to an increasing degree of government uh, control uh, and direction, not just to so-called priority sectors, but to sectors and individuals that were preferred uh, by the politicians and subsequently also by some of the bureaucracy. Critics maintain this economic move was propelled by political compulsions of the day and underlined a crucial dogma within which were retained seeds of populism which for the next two decades would shape the nation's economic agenda. When Indira Gandhi asked the president to dissolve the parliament on the 27th of December 1970 and call for fresh elections, she had just abolished privy purses for the former Maharajas. Now the slogan she used to fight her electoral battle was Garibi Hatao remove poverty. In this terse clarion call lay the rationale for what was the principal linchpin of the economic policies of the country. With huge masses living below the poverty line, with basic needs of food, clothing and shelter as their main concern, the political establishment could hardly ignore these issues. It was precisely this concern which the draughtsmen of independent India had in mind when they formulated the first economic policies of the government. Poverty and underdevelopment had both to be tackled on a war footing. The schedule for economic growth was dictated by this sense of urgency. On the domestic front, two centuries of colonial rule had atrophied India's agrarian economy and left it with scarce infrastructure for any meaningful industrialization. For Nehru, investments in heavy industries was critical. 
He looked at rapid industrialization as a solution to many of the pressing problems of an underdeveloped nation. Built on the banks of the country's holiest of holy rivers, the Ganga, the imposing factories of Bharat Heavy Electricals Limited, or BHEL, symbolize what Jawaharlal Nehru once called the temples of modern India. Here in the pilgrimage town of Haridwar, this simile seems that much more apt. For from the vast expanse of BHEL factories can be seen the traditional temples. It was in the second five-year plan that this thrust towards heavy industries was given. The argument was simply that investments in public sector was imperative and that the emphasis should be on heavy industries if the country was to achieve economic independence. Pandit Nehru did not take to public undertakings as a free will because nobody was ready to invest in these uh, industry and Pandit Nehru is known to have said that a country of India size cannot depend from outside resources for these basic uh, capital goods. This period saw the commissioning of mega projects and the laying of foundations for massive state intervention in core sectors. There was a euphoric assertion that the public sector units would now occupy the commanding heights of India's economy. The first stage of construction was completed in February 1959 when President Rajendra Prasad inaugurated the production of pig iron. It was not long before other sections of the plant were completed. Over the years, however, opposition has grown from the perception that public sector was inefficient and symbolized waste. government now gets around 2.4 percent as dividends and interest on the almost 200,000 crores the center has invested in the public sector and the average borrowing rate of government last year is 9.1 percent the marginal rate of borrowing today is well over 13 percent for government so 2.4 2.5 percent return is a ridiculous return and clearly this is not a desirable thing but there are many who acknowledge that the public sector units have played a vital role in the development of indian industry during the last 50 years Panditji's dream was that the public sector would be a pace setter in India's development because through the public sector his dream was to socialize profits. Socializing profit means you kill two birds with one stone. Profits are the biggest source of further investment. By socializing profits, therefore you increase the rate of investment and capital accumulation. But profits are also the source of income distribution. By socializing profits, you reduce the inequalities of income and wealth. That was the dream. In spite of this persuasive argument, critics of public sector units maintain that social objectives behind these projects have had serious implications for their productivity. That these units nurtured a monopolistic attitude and stunted private enterprise. Any debate about India's economic agenda cannot overlook the legacy of the Gandhian philosophy. Gandhi's nightmare was a machine-dominated society which would suck India's villagers from her countryside. Gandhi wanted a balance between progress and a mindless consumer society. His was also a passionate commitment to self-reliant villages, cottage industries and cooperative societies. For Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the charkha, the spinning wheel, was a symbol he used with lethal effect, a weapon in his political armory. 
As early as 1920, when he gave a call to boycott foreign goods and clothes, he urged Indians to use the charka to replace the textile machinery. To weave their own yarn, and inevitably, khadi became the dress code of the freedom fighters. Gandhi's vision can still be found in these khadi emporiums and in the cooperative societies. In the village of Anand in Gujarat was born one such Gandhian dream. It began as a modest milk producers cooperative collecting about 200 litres of milk a day. An indigenous response challenging the might of the giant Polson Limited. During the last 50 years it has transformed into a corporate success story collecting over 1 million litres of milk every day and producing butter and related products under the brand name of Amul. The story of Amul has been replicated in many other parts of the country, offering a model which truly synthesizes the Gandhian approach to economy. What we are talking about is seeking the larger dimensions of development, which is development of men. Development of milk, development of cows is not so important as development of man. And to develop man, you have to involve him in the processes of development. You have to create structures he commands. You have to give him the responsibility so that he becomes responsible. Although Nehru had great respect for Mahatma Gandhi's views, he was a man in a hurry and believed that only through science and technology and industrialization could he hasten the pace of progress. He believed that the planning process was a crucial element in the making of a new India. Published in December 1952, the first five-year plan of the Government of India stressed the role of the state as the prime mover of change. The focus of the plan was the rural sector and specially production of food grains. A primarily agrarian economy could not afford to ignore the agriculture sector. India, after all, was composed of over 600,000 villages and the landholding patterns in these rural areas was shaping the distribution of economic wealth in the country. For Nehru and his colleagues, land reforms was an essential input in this building of modern India and only through this could social justice and equitable distribution of wealth be achieved. Land reforms had been a political commitment by the Congress even prior to independence. It had declared that the land must belong to the tiller. Rural debts should be written off for agricultural labourers and state credit institutions nationalised to replace the evil money lenders. The aim was to wipe out all traces of landlordism and semi-feudalism. But the reality was different. In most cases, it was difficult to implement because the rural rich dominated the establishment and they resisted change. Therefore, even if Zamindari was officially abolished, radical agrarian reforms which were required never took place. By the time Indira Gandhi was sworn in as Prime Minister on the 25th of January 1966, the country was still dependent on imported food grains to feed its people. In 1966, drought and an impending famine-like situation was prevalent in parts of the country. India had barely recovered from the disastrous war in 1962, when the 1965 Indo-Pakistan War had taken place. By late 1966, food riots and spiralling inflation made the situation tense in some parts of the country. Mrs. Gandhi knew that the country had to achieve self-sufficiency in food, and at the earliest, if it was to feed its teeming millions. A decision was taken to encourage farmers to use high-yielding varieties of seeds. From about 1968 onwards, our progress was more towards yield per hectare or per area, and that was caused about by the high-yielding varieties of wheat, of rice, of uh, jowar, bajra, maize, and uh, they were all grown with water, irrigation water, and good soil fertility management. The high-yielding varieties were capable of converting irrigation water and soil nutrients into grains. This is what we started calling Green Revolution.
Dr. M. S. Swaminathan was one of the motivating spirits of this green revolution, and he remembers those heady days which to a great degree transformed the rural landscape of the country. When a farmer, poor farmer produced five tons of wheat, where they were only producing one ton, the whole technology spread like wildfire. A small government program became a mass movement, and that was a great accomplishment. Otherwise, the green revolution would have never come by any government program. It had to come, government was a trigger, a catalyst, but it was the farmers who, who made it a movement. For a few weeks every year, this man, the Met officer in Tiruvannandapuram, becomes one of the most sought-after prophets in the country. His job, to predict the arrival of the monsoon. From these verandas, he watches and studies the coming of the cloud patterns. The build-up, which heralds one of the most sensational natural occurrences in the country. The dark brooding clouds, the bearer of torrential rain, which has come to symbolize relief from the oppressive summer heat and portends prosperity for the land. For the monsoon is inextricably linked to the country's agricultural fortunes, which in turn determines the economic well-being of the nation. But over a period of 50 years, the rural landscape has been changing, and even the link with the monsoon has become feeble. Over the last uh, couple of decades, India has become relatively more insulated from the monsoon than it has been in the past. There has been a tremendous development of both major and minor irrigation, a huge number of pump sets, the tapping of underground water, uh, the setting up of small and large dams. I think on the whole, there has been a considerable improvement in the uh, dependency uh, of Indian agriculture on the monsoon. Famines and hunger, which were regular features in India, are now more the exception than the rule. And even when they do take place, they are contained. And a country which once had to rely on the shiploads of PL480 food grains, which arrived from the USA to feed its people, thanks to the Green Revolution, can now boast of surplus food grains. The Indian economic model, as envisaged by Nehru, was a mixed one where private capital existed side by side the state industries. And in any case, India never had any dearth of private entrepreneurship. Even in the early years of the 20th century India were stories of individual visionaries. One such was a Parsi man whose forefathers had landed in the coast of Gujarat, escaping religious persecution. The genius of Jamshedji is that he alone in his time understood the full significance of the Industrial Revolution in the West and of its potential for his own country. Where others saw India's freedom primarily or exclusively in terms of political action, he saw clearly that India's freedom could not be achieved or sustained by political means alone. The township in Bihar, which bears his name, is testament to the foresight of this entrepreneur. Successive generations of this family bearing the name of Tata have become synonymous with industrial progress in the country. After independence, a handful of industrial dynasties controlled major shares of the private wealth. But private wealth was viewed with a degree of suspicion. Industrial laws during these days were essentially devised to regulate and control private industries. The acts were designed so that economic power was not concentrated in the hands of big business alone, but an array of controls, permits and licenses only helped generate an unhealthy nexus between the politician, the bureaucrat and the industrialist. By 1961, an official study showed that less than 2% of the country's companies owned 53% of the total private capital, whereas 86% of the others owned 15% of the capital. For most observers, it was evident that by the mid-70s and late 80s, the license quota Raj, as this era was dubbed, had contributed to distortions in the system. Uh, Indian trade and business is like water. Water always finds its way, its way around barriers. And if it cannot find its way around a barrier, it goes underground. So that's what happened in India. Uh, when we found controls to be terribly excessive, Indian industry and trade began to go underground. It developed a large black economy. 
uh, you began to develop a huge overseas economy, which nobody knows about. Uh, the IMF has estimated that over $100 billion of Indian money is lying outside. The country's economy had become stagnant and fiscal crisis was reaching alarming proportions. Experts argued that the economy needed to be given a shock therapy if it was to respond to the challenges. There was already a contention that Indian economy must shed its shackles, that it was time it should dovetail itself to the global system. November 1989, Rajiv Gandhi had lost the elections. The Congress party was in the opposition. Rajiv Gandhi's former finance minister VP Singh was heading a coalition cobbled together by parties holding disparate philosophies. By the end of 1990, the BJP, an electoral ally of VP Singh, decided to launch a nationwide Rath Yatra, a chariot pilgrimage in support of building a temple in the disputed Babri Masjid site at Ayodhya. The BJP withdrew its support of the VP Singh government when LK Adwani was arrested and the Rath Yatra halted. The political uncertainty that followed camouflaged a grim reality. Economists explain that over the past 40 years, a series of debatable economic decisions had led the country to the brink of financial collapse. Chandrasekhar, the young Turk who had stood with Mrs. Gandhi during her fight against the old guards in 1969, had by now replaced VP Singh as Prime Minister. By May 1991, the country was in the throes of yet another election. And during this campaign, Rajiv Gandhi was assassinated by a human bomb at Siri Pirimbadur near Madras. By June 1991, the Congress party came back to power once again. But economic realities were such that the government headed by Narasimha Rao and its finance minister, Dr. Manmohan Singh, decided to take one of the most radical breaks from the past. Uh, when our government came into office, Foreign exchange reserves had totally disappeared. We had no money to import even the most essential things of, uh, which we needed. Uh, no foreigner was willing to give any loan to India. Even the non-resident Indians who had kept money with our banks, they were withdrawing money. It was in that uh, d uh, difficult situation that we had to pledge gold with the Bank of England to raise even a small loan. Uh, that was the situation which we inherited. It was a very humiliating thing for India and we resolved that we must create an environment in where, whereby such things will not happen. Ironically, the same Congress which had for the last 50 years sworn by socialism and supported a command economy was rewriting a new economic agenda. Almost every one of the shackles which curbed private enterprise was now being withdrawn. Suddenly, India was being viewed by the world as an emerging giant, with the potential of being on par with the economies of the Pacific Rim nations. The purpose of the economic reform of 91 was to bring out this tremendous uh, spirit of adventure and enterprise which exists in our country, to uh, bring it into the open and to use it to build a, one of the most dynamic, competitive economies of the world and simultaneously a compassionate society. By 1995, these cars rolling out of a state-of-the-art factory near Noida in Uttar Pradesh symbolized one other facet of India's economic profile. Economic historians contrast this with these advertisements appearing in Indian newspapers in 1947 for bicycles most of which were cobbled together from imported elements. Fifty years later, in 1997, in these modern factories, cycles are manufactured by the thousands to be exported all over the world. A village near Hyderabad, Pochampalli, is today famous worldwide for the weaves which go to make saris that carry the unique label of its geography. And these modern textile mills in Ahmedabad produce denim material, which makes Arvind Mills the third largest producer of denim cloth in the entire world. In some ways, the narrative of contemporary India's economic growth is fused with this interweaving of the traditional and the modern. 
With liberalization, a new phase in the country's economic agenda has begun. The unshackling of the economy does not mean that the basic problems facing the country have all disappeared or that they can be wished away.